part one of this series, Breath, we started breaking down vocal technique into its elements for one very good reason. Once you can manipulate those elements at will, you can be confident that the sound that comes out of your mouth is the sound you intended and not just the sound that you're stuck with. And that's the power of technique. Today's technique is resonance. Hi, my name is Scott Cameron. You're watching Inside Musicals, the channel for all things musical theatre. Now, technical terms can be very confusing. Uh, for example, in, in today's video, terms like resonance, vibration, tone could all refer to the oscillation that happens in the vocal folds, or they could just as easily describe the sonic character of the voice. Likewise, breath and air could simply be what fills the lungs, or it could also describe that intangible something in the voice at certain frequencies, the way people use words like twang, or ping, glass, brass. Oh, my Sondheim! <sighs> so don't stress if we don't use the same terminology. Use whatever words make sense for you. The important thing is, at least by the end of this video, that you understand three elements of resonance that work hand in hand. How we create sound, phonation. How we amplify it, projection. And then the character or the quality of the voice, which we might call tone or tone colour. So throughout this video, try the exercises with me. At the end, I'll give you some examples of how you can start messing with things and put them to practical use. Okay, let's start with phonation. Ooh, phonation. It sounds so formal. Now, the simplest way of thinking about phonation is simply vibration versus air, or vibration versus breath. So try this with me, just gently touching the throat on a mmm sound, and mmm, notice the vibrations. Then on a whisper, no vibrations. So our first principle is to maximise those vibrations on an efficient breath, because uh, that'll become very important, not just in this episode, but uh, as we move on. Now, without going into too much anatomy, the larynx, or voice box, is where we'll find the vocal folds. Top of the larynx is the epiglottis that opens and closes, well, to stop saliva and food falling down the trachea and into the lungs. So try this with me, just to visualise where it is and how it moves, and it's just a gentle cough. Can you feel how it closes in preparation and springs open for the air? Once again. Well, that's the epiglottis. When those muscles close together, it also draws together the vocal folds so that as air passes through the larynx, they're in a position where they can flutter or vibrate. Phonation. So let's try this. Um, the most basic of basics, an R sound, like you've already done. But this time what I want you to visualise is how the, the epiglottis opens for the breath, closes in preparation, then opens just enough for the sound. So breathing. Ah, once again. Ah. Can you feel that muscle at work? It's such a tiny little mechanism. And a side note, um, coughing or hard glottal sounds can tend to put a strain on the vocal folds. So in good practice, we tend to avoid them in favour of easing cleanly onto the sound. Ah. Ah. Instead of attacking it. Ah. Ah. Because if you attack it, you're more likely to, to split or crack the note, particularly if it's a sustained note. On the other hand, I have seen people prepare with a really good breath and expel half of it before they make a sound. Ha. Ah. That's not good either. First of all, the beginning of the note is indistinct. But secondly, you've lost half of your breath of support. So straight onto a clean tone. Ah, much more efficient. Now we can think of the vocal folds as a double reed instrument, a bit like a bassoon or an oboe, or as I said in the last episode, mais oui, je suis un ballon, where the right kind of tension creates a useful resistance to the flow of air. You know, too much tension and the vocal folds can't vibrate freely not enough tension, and there's nothing but air. And again, they can't vibrate freely. So what we want is that middle ground where there's enough tension to draw the vocal folds together, but not so much that it causes strain. So try this exercise with me to feel that difference 
in those three positions, going from strain to tone to air. It's a deep breath with me. Strain, starting with strain. Uh, might do it on more of an R sound. Uh, can you hear that difference? Can you feel that difference? So if you're ever unsure what useful tension is, come back to this exercise to find that middle ground. The other thing to notice is when you're just straining, what we're hearing is more white noise than actual pitch information, which is fine if you want to try multi-harmonic throat singing. But not for much else, because your pitch is just not going to be accurate. And that's just another example of where efficiency is our friend. Now, if you know anything about audio, you'll probably understand the difference between frequency and amplitude. Frequency being the number of fluctuations per second, or pitch. Amplitude being the depth of those fluctuations, which to our ears translates as volume. Same principle at work in our voice. As long as the vocal folds are connected efficiently, an increased flow of air increases the amplitude of those fluctuations to increase the volume independently of pitch. So in this exercise, notice how we increase and decrease the flow of air to get louder and softer on an R, ah, deep breath. Ah. Oh, I could hear a little bit of wavering in there. And in this kind of exercise, there can be a tendency for pitch to waver, and we just need to be mindful of that because there's a number of tensions going on. With that increased force, from air, uh, we have an increased resistance to stabilise the mechanism. And if they don't transition evenly, or if one of them gets stuck, then you'll hear that in either pitch or the tone of the voice. Plus, as we learned in the last episode, if we're not working on that full breath, uh, you hear that strain of the effort. So once again, deep breath, not too breathy, not too tight, maintaining pitch on an R, deep breath. Ah. It sounded a little bit more even to me. And of course, there can be another pressure point here, and that is if we oversing. If we push too hard, too much volume, too much flow of air. Once again, it could put strain on the vocal folds. Um, they can get out of sync or spasm and create a, a crack or split in the tone or, or the continuity of the sound. Mais je voudrais chanter fort. Mais bien sûr. Uh, but of course, but the energy from our lungs is only our basic volume control. There's more to it than just the air that's coming out of our mouth. Take this music box, for instance. When I play it in the air, it barely makes a sound. The minute it touches a solid object, all of a sudden it's much louder. So what's going on? I'm glad you asked. So for the sake of argument, let's call it conduction. And this is where resonance really comes into its own. Now by itself, this little mechanism, like this little mechanism, can only move so much air, so many sound waves. But the minute it's touching that other object, those sound waves are conducted through a much larger surface area to reinforce the amplitude or volume. Oh, incroyable! And that's why a piano has a wooden box. It's not for aesthetics, it's not uh, for convenience. It's a natural amplifier, a resonating chamber, like our body. See, you thought I'd lost the plot, and here I was making a point. So from this little mechanism in the throat, we can amplify those vibrations through our bones and the hollow cavities of our body. So let's put it to the test. Try this with me on a mmm sound, rich and warm, just moving up and down the middle part of your range, touching the jaw. Notice the vibrations. The nose. The brow. Back of the skull. The chest. clavicle, and even the back. Now some of those areas will seem to vibrate more, more clearly than others, more obviously than others. So I encourage you to explore how changing pitch, changing volume, changing the shape of the mouth, muscle tension, posture, how much air is coming through the nose, how all of those affect the way we place 
those vibrations in the body, if you've ever heard the term placement, or the way we emphasize those vibrations in different parts of the body, because all of those things do make a difference. And the point is, the more we optimize this resonating chamber, the less we have to force from the throat. And that's, that's gotta be a good thing. So that's our second approach to phonation. And just as a side note, uh, if you're ever in the recording studio, get rid of any beanies, hats, scarves, heavy clothes, and even tie your hair back, because all of those will dull the vibrations and you'll hear it on the microphone. Tip from me to you. <gasps> now our third tool for projection is one you might not expect, and that's our imagination. In this case, simply the power of connecting with what we say. If you're non-committal or half-assed, hey, you, you get a non-committal half-assed sound. <laughs> but the minute you connect with the idea, hey, you, not only does it sound more purposeful, but it actually coordinates the body's innate intelligence, how to breathe, volume, uh, resonance, attack. Because you've done it hundreds of times before. You know how to get someone's attention from the other side of the room if you really need to and make it sound convincing. So try that with me. Non-committal first, hey you. Hey you, and then with focus, hey you. And can you notice how easy it is to make the sound strong but with absolutely no strain? That's exactly what we want. Because it's not about just being loud, it's about coordinating all those aspects of the body that contribute to that sense of strength. And you know, on the other hand, maybe you're singing a lullaby to a child. Instead of just thinking softly, give yourself a purpose. Think maybe to soothe. And then the tone takes care of itself. Then the tone takes care of itself. Not much of a song, I know. But the point is, it could be warm, it could be gentle, it could be airy, it could be smiling, it could be all of those things. But the point is, it's the idea that coordinates the body. That's our third rule for projection. People use words like timbre, texture, character to distinguish one sound from another, and that's tone colour. Even people with no musical background can distinguish between, say, a flute and an oboe playing the same note. And that's because when they play that note, they're playing more than just the fundamental or note name. The way the sound rattles through the instruments causes uh, sympathetic resonances or overtones at predictable frequencies above that fundamental and the shape, size, density of the material changes the balance of those frequencies for a distinctive character. So whether we're a flute, oboe, human, we have an innate sonic signature. Good thing about being human, we don't have to settle for it. So as we discovered in amplification, we can either emphasize or de-emphasize vibrations in the body. And as a general rule, the more vibrations in the head, the brighter the sound, the more in the chest, the warmer the sound. Now this is different from head voice and chest voice. That's a whole other conversation we'll get to in, in part four. But where it's predominantly head, it'll be bright, but it could also be thin or shrill. If it's predominantly chest, it'll be warm, but it could also be dull and muddy. So for a rich sound, an efficient sound, we want a balance of both. I mean, why would you use only half an amplification system? So try this exercise with me um, to start thinking about the character of the voice and the difference between the fundamental and the overtones. It's on the words, why you, very slowly, very robotic, moving through the vowels, and why you, why you. I know, a little bit weird, but can you hear how it's kind of like a parametric equalizer sweeping through certain frequencies, even though the fundamental, the note I'm singing, stays the same? Well, they're the overtones. And that's just by changing the shape of my mouth and tongue. Once we factor in what happens in the throat, the chest, the, the muscles, the bones, we can kind of fudge our shape, size and density for endless variations of tone colour. And they're all valid in the right context because we don't just have one voice. Depending on the, the, the song, the character, the style, the context, we sing differently. You wouldn't use a clean, full-toned, formal operatic sound 
to sing a contemporary pop song. It would just sound out of place. There's nothing wrong with that kind of voice, but in that context, that's not the voice we're after. So there'll be times where we want our voice to sound dull or rich or bright or reedy or thin or husky or breathy. So one of the best things you can do is to mimic other voices. Because learning to sing is as much about training your ears as it is anything else and having a mental picture for the sound that you want. And mimicking others, you're not only making those physical adjustments, but you're creating a more flexible voice. It's got to be a win. I'll give you an example, and this is another place where imagination really helps. Imagine I asked you to tense the larynx to subdue the chest resonance, to overemphasize the, the brightness in the face plate, to place your voice in a high to mid part of the chest voice. You'd kind of be at a loss to understand what I was getting at. But if I said, oh, speak like Fran Drescher from the nanny, you go, oh, oh, Mr. Sheffield, oh, Mr. Sheffield. <laughs> It's not a really good impression. I'm just thinking off the top of my head. But you know, you'd do it once or twice and you'd probably get there because you had a mental image for the sound that you wanted. And so you'd get there. So whether you're mimicking great singers or weird characters, it's worth exploring those sounds because it'll broaden your vocabulary. I mean, maybe you want to speak or sing lower in your range, down with plenty of chest resonance, but brightness for presence, good articulation. Think James Earl Jones. Luke, I am your fund manager. I think that's what he said. Maybe you want a covered tone, like be a little bit like a block to nose. Then think like Macaulay Culkin in practically any Macaulay Culkin movie. Would I want to sing like that? Sing with a covered tone, sing with a balanced tone, sing with a nanny tone. Either could be valid. I mean, maybe you want an intimate sound, delicate, with a bit of smile and lots of air. Think like Marilyn Monroe. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Or maybe doing a character and you want a little bit more air through the nose, then maybe you want to think like Mr. Snuffleupagus from Sesame Street. Hey, big bird. Or maybe you want a tension in the throat and you want to be really stingy with your air because somebody farted. Think like uh, Bill Clinton. I did not have sandwiches with that woman. I think that's what he said. Or maybe you want a different kind of tension and you want to subdue a lot of that resonance. Think like a mobster. Hey, Frankie, why do you want to go bust in my balls? Now, not all of these sounds are efficient for singing, but they can be effective for character. And as actors and singers, it's up to us to find that balance between the two. So today, we found a balance between tone and breath on phonation. We amplified it with energy from the lungs, the resonating chamber, and a little push from our imagination. And then we gave it character with tone color and a little push from our imagination. I think there's a pattern happening here. So as I said at the beginning, once you can master each of these elements, you can be confident that the sound that comes out of your mouth is a sound you intended, not just some sound you're stuck with. And that gives you choices, and that gives you confidence. So explore, don't be afraid to sound ridiculous, because sometimes it's when we, when we step outside of our own patterns, we discover something unexpected. And look, sometimes that'll be completely dog awful, but then sometimes it could be glorious. So what are your aha moments? What breakthroughs have you made when suddenly the penny drops and you're like, oh my son, I get it now. Leave it in the comments and be sure to come back for part three, articulation, because we've got more skills to add to our arsenal. Until then, show me some love, give me some thumbs, subscribe, send me your credit card details. I'm kidding, of course. <laughs> you don't have to give me the thumbs.